morning uh, and welcome to Sleep Grand Round. So I'm giving a talk on the update of obstructive sleep apnea in people with Down syndrome. Uh, we'll try to cover from birth to adulthood. Um, in the chat, you see slido.com because there's going to be a little bit of an interaction, hopefully. Uh, hopefully this works. I have to I have to log into Slido. I just realized that. Um, so it may not work. One second, guys. One second. If I can just do something really quick. So this is why you want to come early, and I try to do that. But as some people know, I had a, another incident with my tire, same tire. <laughs> Um, and I don't see, okay, so Slido is not going to work today. I am so, so upset about that. That's okay. Um, it's an interaction. So that interaction is no longer there. So I will interact with you in a different way. <laughs> Perfect. Love it. Whichever way possible. Okay. So I'm going to start. Okay. Lexi has the first one pulled up the slide on for you, so I don't know if it's just not showing that it's popped in. How in the world do you have it? Okay. You get a text, so you can just I put it in text. You I just logged in, slide and you found it. Com and then put in your code. You have a code. Wow, wow, wow. So everybody do that, please. I don't know how you're going to do it, but... Uh... <laughs> for, for us online, what's the code? Yeah, it'll be on the third slot. It'll be on the third slot. You'll see it in a second. Okay, so Jeff, I'll get to the Slido part. This part of the audience response, if it works, it'd be great. If not, I apologize for that. Um, so during this talk, we're gonna describe the presentation risks and guidelines. And there are guidelines for monitoring sleep disorder breathing and Down syndrome. We're gonna illustrate some of the current literature and the outcome data for obstructive sleep apnea, for which is really growing. And so it's nice to be a part of that growth. Um, and then demonstrate some of the challenges and opportunities for these for treatment op options in particular for this group. So slido.com, uh, if you want, you can go in there just uh, uh, like Lexi did and put in the 4826001 and we could do some interaction. I don't know if it'll come up here or not, so we'll find out. Um, so what is your preferred wait time? This is sort of a warm up just to make sure everybody's you know, able to use it. Um, Sally, can you show us the code again? Sorry, I missed it. Uh, just, it just says, type your question. 482600. If it doesn't work, we're just going to nix it for the talk. Because I have no way to remedy that. Okay. I, I think it got, uh, it's not even a part of the PowerPoint, so it's a it's a UH block, unfortunately. Okay. Even though I tested it at UH, but on this computer, I didn't test it, and that's going to be a problem. So okay. sorry about that. Um, and one of the questions is, what is your comfort level talk, talking, taking care, not talking, taking care of people with Down syndrome sleep disorders? And so hopefully at the end of this talk, you'll be a little bit more comfortable. Um, let's start with Down syndrome genetics and general facts. And yes, we will start with the basics, right? Because that's where it all begins. Um, and so everybody in medical school remember the karyotype. I used to love this, right? So, you know, we are born with 23 pairs of chromosome, one of which is our uh, uh, sex chromosome. And then of course on 21 is uh, the trisomy 21. Trisomy 21 is the most common malformation and one in 660 births um, worldwide. It's also the most common. So you have a third one there. So it becomes 47 instead of 46. And in this case, female XX, so plus 21. Um, what happens? Right at birth, 96% of trisomy 21s, it happens right at the my, myotic division, right there. So instead of you know dividing equally two and two, a third one gets there and then it migrates into the genome of that particular patient. Um, less so is inherited translocation and mosaicism, but most of what we see is the non-trajectin. And of course it is uh, very prevalent. Um, and in fact, more and more people with Down syndrome are in our population, especially after the seventies, there was a really, um, you know, a fall off of mortality, thankfully. And, and so the, now we're seeing these patients go into adulthood much more and out of the pediatric clinics and a lot more into adult clinics. Uh, and so we need to be prepared to take care of them. There's a myriad of things that happens with trisomy 21, including cardiac GI, ENT, endocrine, um, 
You know, these patients uh, neurologically have a lot of autism, uh, developmental delays and intellectual disability, which will be something we talk about in this talk. So I wanted to highlight that. Additionally, Alzheimer's. And these, these patients don't live that long. And so they're getting Alzheimer's early on. And how can we, for perhaps in sleep, be a part of their trajectory to, to make those outcomes a little bit better? And of course, what we're gonna focus on today is the obstructive sleep apnea piece. Okay, so sleep apnea and Down syndrome. Can I ask a question? Is of course. syndrome spectrum? It is a, it's a genetic disorder. So yeah. it's, you know, in, in sort of the but spectrum is, is you're it, talking is about. Is it expression though of all the facets of it? Are different for each individual? Are different for each individual. Absolutely. So right, that right. you could be, you, you could recognize this at several different age groups. You can different at different facets of disease that might be expressed by the gene absolutely at different parts of their okay. life. So they're modifying genes in here that, that do that. But Most yeah, people. potentially. Yeah, potentially. Uh, although I don't know why they stop with that choice. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's a good, you know, some people will have the Hirschsprungs and the cardiac stuff very, very early on. And others will have some of these other things kind of develop earlier and have that, you know, that phenotypic expression later on. Um, they're very uh, flexible, <laughs> right? So in the sleep lab, we see all sorts of positions and, and this is quite commonly uh, described um, not only by parents, but now in the literature. And the sitting forward position is particularly common. These are all patients from our sleep lab very recently. So this is how common it is. You, you will find it if you look for it. That sleeping position, sitting forward and kneeling forward. I, I, it looks very uncomfortable to me. I don't know how they do it, but they do it quite often. And it is actually something. So some, some people said, let's study this. And it turns out patients with Down syndrome prefer the non-sleep position. There's very, very few of them. They're actually on their back. And then they said, well, is that because of their breathing? And it doesn't seem to be impacted by age or AHI, um, but although there may be some subtle things that make them uh, want to do that position a little bit more frequently. So what are the predisposing factors for down for sleep apnea and Down syndrome? There's many. So there's a general hypotonia. You can see this uh, child uh, sort of displaying this kind of open mouth posture, um, sort of just a general kind of hypotonia flat face, especially mid-face hypoplasia, micrognathia, uh, uh, small upper airway, when they did some volume studies, very, very small upper airway. And then on top of that, you'll have the adenotonsillar uh, hypertrophy in that same space, really encroaching on that airway. And then glossoptosis where the tongue could, could go back um, and into that small airway and really close off. Um, in addition to that, they're more likely to have obesity, which I'll show you some data on the central distribution in particular, as well as hypothyroidism, which is why it's part of the recommendations for guidelines for screening. And then on top of all of that, they could have airway abnormalities, which re could really um, augment sort of some of the sleep disorder breeding that we see. In addition to those risk factors, we have both adult and pediatric risk factors. On the top of the list for adults, right, the age, BMI, et cetera. On pediatrics, the top of the list is adenomyotonical hypertrophy. And so that's a very sheer difference with risk factor profiling, particularly when you, when you move from age into uh, adulthood, as well as these other things. And of course, neuromuscular tone underpins both pediatric and adult obstructive sleep apnea. So I'm gonna start with some data. Um, what can we do to kind of mitigate sleep apnea? What can we do to, you know, really look for it and screen for it? It turns out parents are unable to predict sleep apnea. And so if we ask them about, you know, sleep apnea symptoms, they're underreported. Um, and then when we do a PSG, there, there's a there's a lot that have, um, you know, apnea. And when you ask them kind of retrospectively, 15%, uh, observe apnea, 39% habitual snoring. So you stop paying, especially in gross, look at this kind of data is also in adults. It doesn't really work very well. Although, you know, some of those typical symptoms are there, you're gonna miss them if you just do symptom-based reporting. Um, parents also under and over report symptoms. So when they think there might be a problem, so there's a mixed um, 
situation with, with symptom reporting, and then come to the clinic. And then what do we base it on? Well, we look at tonsillar size in the pediatric clinic. We also look at BMI. It turns out those don't predict obstructive sleep apnea either, as you'll see also in um, other literature. And then a meta-analysis looking at, let's look at all this pool, look at every little predictor. And the only thing that came out was really age. Um, not sex. And you'll you'll note that in pediatrics, you know, there's a gender distribution that's equal in both man, male, males and females. Um, and in one study, looking at severe obstructive sleep apnea, and, and note, obstructive sleep apnea severity, AHI greater than 10. <laughs> and, you know, people will look at it and go, what? <laughs> so that is considered severe in, in, in sleep apnea. And I'll show you some data to support that. Um, so in, in a study looking at children, severe sleep apnea was noted in 53 of them, and there were no clinical predictors in, in that population, which is, which is rather remarkable, and 40% didn't have any symptoms at all. And so this, this really drove some of, the, some of the guidelines, which I'll show you in a second. Um, what's the prevalence? This looks at a meta, this meta-analysis from 2018. Um, based on the AHI of one event, which is you know, the, the criterion for obstructive sleep apnea in children, 69% have uh, obstructive sleep apnea. If you really wanna hold on to your AHI of five, 50% have obstructive sleep apnea, still quite a large number, large prevalence. And so um, this sort of led into some of the guidelines that we see for obstructive sleep apnea. So this was gonna ask you about what are the current guidelines for evaluation of obstructive sleep apnea in children? And does anyone know? Are there guidelines? Does anyone know? You can blurt it out online if you know. Testing. Testing. <laughs> All that data hopefully was, <laughs> was sort of put, you know, giving it, giving it away. We need to test okay. without don't don't rely on symptoms. So it turns out the health supervision of Down syndrome guidelines, which has been around for a very, very, very long time. The pediatric group has really been trailblazers in this, and you'll see the adult group is coming on board. But the health supervision, age one to five, um, says PSG by four years old, essentially. So we, you know, I was part of the EPIC team to sort of build that in so that pediatricians can sort of be alerted, hey, do we have a PSG on file or not? And so we can get that sort of, you know, in thinking through sort of their care plan. Um, so it turns out we also need family-friendly labs. If we're going to do these studies readily and we need to be able to do them, uh, we need to help children's families, not just children, but adults who with special needs, and we need to be family-friendly to be able to do that. Thankfully, we have uh, wonderful pediatric sleep technologists who take good care of their families. Will they accept an indication being trisomy 21? It's sleep disorder breathing as an evaluation. Yeah, you still have to put the right codes in. <laughs> you know, play that insurance game, but it is for sleep disorder breathing, so it's legitimate. Um, at, at the health supervision, five to less than 12 and 12 to 21, and by the way, you know, this sort of pediatric maybe falls in that under 21 blanket, so there is some overlap there, but, but now it becomes there's no more PSG testing, right, so it's more symptom-based history of abnormal event than referral needed, but so, so that's where I think this is where some gaps are and some data will show us whether or not we need to, when we need to repeat test some testing. So some other things discuss obesity. Um, and interestingly, they're looking at RLS. No mention of uh, sleep duration because we don't have the data just yet, but hopefully in the future we will. So how do you think we're doing with these guidelines as of 2023? And so I'm uh, sorry that we don't get to interact here. I'm gonna just tell you the answer. Um, so pre and post guidelines in a retrospective cohort, looking at sort of before and after the guidelines. And by the way, the guidelines actually came in 20, uh, 20 um, um, I think 11 was the, sort of the, the the newer one and then it was reiterated in after the you know the, the ones that I showed you right so it's been around for a long time but before that how are we doing we weren't doing that bad um so so most people were getting PSGs um, but the difference pre and post guidelines was that they were getting their PSGs before that age of four or more often so the younger patients are getting more PSGs um mean age at first PSG was 3.4 versus 5.3 before the guidelines. So we're getting younger children in the sleep lab. Um, and But the rate of sleep apnea was no different. We weren't picking up any more obstructive sleep apnea. So, so it's just a matter of getting in earlier, which I think is actually helpful for earlier intervention. And so what about the adult side? So there's global and national efforts uh, for adult outcomes in Down syndrome. 
And so looking at this group, uh, which was a, a group called the Global Down Syndrome Foundation Medical Care Guidelines for Adults with Down Syndrome Work Group, so, so it's, a, it's a big uh, mouthful. They formed in 2016, and their um, commitment is to really develop guidelines, which I'll show you in the next slide, and then, to, and then redo those guidelines because we realize there's not that much evidence every five to six years. And so we'll be seeing some of that data come through and maybe a next guideline here, but I'm gonna give you some um, understanding of the gu current guidelines. And then the second thing I wanted to point out, what are we doing on a national level? It turns out the NIH really put a lot of funding into research in Down syndrome. Um, and you'll hear about this INCLUDE project, which really kind of augments the funding for anyone who wants to do research in this area. And so what do the guidelines say? The adult guidelines um, is, is sort of, they, and they highlight evidence is really sort of weak and recommendations may be uh, weak with the exception of maybe number four, uh, which says begin assessments at the age 20, uh, excuse me, not 20, excuse me, 40 to detect domains of cognitive functioning because we're looking for um, uh, even the mildest decline in cognitive you know, functioning as it relates to the progression into things like dementia, Alzheimer's dementia. Other things you know, are, are listed here. Notice there's no light item for sleep apnea, not one. And so in, but if you look in their 90 pages of their guidelines, you'll see that sleep apnea and sleep is mentioned under all of these things, under behavior, under dementia, under diabetes, under obesity. And so they just don't know where to put it yet because we just don't have the data to, to give it its own line item and then what it would be the recommendation. So I think, you know, that this guideline is from 2020 and they promised to give us you know, five to six later. So we're, we're good with this guideline for a while. As the evidence emerges, we'll probably be seeing a change in that and some more specific guidelines for obstructive sleep apnea in adults um, in, the, in the next five to six years. Why do we care? <laughs> Why are we gonna be aggressive about screening? Why do we look at guidelines? What are the consequences specifically of obstructive sleep apnea and Down syndrome? Well, in children, uh, we, can, we can start at the, at the youngest, and as they develop into adulthood. And one of the critical things is really development, right? And so in pediatric, we're, we're, we're trying to help development, behavior, as, and so we can, we can, we can augment that, that growth. Um, and so how does sleep apnea affect that? Well, one study looked at the AHI effects on development and behavior. And we can talk all day if the AHI is the right metric, and sometimes it's not, but in this case, it really did correlate with the child behavior checklist, which is where the behavior um, uh, validated measure as well as the developmental quotient. Um, and negative behaviors were more positive correlated with AHI, meaning that you had more sleep apnea, you had more negative uh, behavior. And then of course, the same with the AHI, higher AHI, less developmental quotient. So that's concerning. Even in this very small study, there were some signals there that we probably need to pay attention to. What about if you look at all children with Down syndrome um, having sleep apnea and no sleep apnea? There's a myriad of studies. The first one being IQ testing uh, and cognitive testing. And if you look at and a lot of these had obstructive sleep apnea, that's not a surprise. Um, and it turns out that obstructive sleep apnea affects language ability. Um, and is particular in communication and expressive language. If you've ever taken care of either children or adults with Down syndrome, you will know about this and you'll see it firsthand. They're quieter before apnea treatment. They don't speak as much, they're a little more anxious. And, the, and, and once you treat their apnea, they're more talkative, the personality blossoms. And, 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 and parents will tell you this. And it's interesting to see that the data supports that as well. Um, using the brief, which is a, a, a measure of executive functioning um, in children. Having sleep apnea was more correlated with a decrease in working memory and emotional control. And then lastly, using the Arizona cognitive test battery um, for cognitive flexibility um, and decreased language functions was associated with it, having obstructive sleep apnea compared to those who didn't. Now, where can you find a, a place where you can improve IQ, right? And you're supposed to be born with this IQ. Well, sleep apnea can really kind of unravel what we can't see. And, and, and they already have a diminished IQ. So whatever we can do to help 
IQ would be very, very good. And sleep apnea is one of those areas. So can we impact cognitive development if we adequately treat sleep apnea? And that answer um, needs, we don't have the answers to that yet, but we hope to do that. This is a study that our site was involved with, helped, yes, it was a multi-center trial. We don't have the data, but they did a you know, neurocognitive battery pre and post TNA. It'll be interesting to see in that group um, how sleep apnea might affect those, those results. And what about adults? Um, so here's a study on, it's a cross-sectional descriptive, only 11 agreed to do PSG. And so you'll see that some of these studies are fraught with sort of difficulties with recruitment, um, which, is a, a, which is very common to a lot of, a lot of these studies. So what, what could we do? But I think that they did a rather good job looking at at least validated measures. So using the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index, and then seeing how that affected, both the PSG and the Quality Index affected some of these outcomes functional independence measure, um, and then also strengths and difficulties questionnaire. A lot of these patients had poor quality sleep, and when they did have poor quality sleep, it was associated with a decrease in a functional independent measure, um, particularly locomotion and cognitive. If you're thinking locomotion, you're, we, we're trying to get people to exercise, and, you know, and, and so that could be rather impactful. Um, and in terms of behavior, more worse global behavior, hyperactivity, and personal care. And so when we're trying to help independence, you know, what are what are some things keeping in the way? It could be uh, that we, we we target sleep apnea. Note that in this study, HI did not correlate with the SDQ, but you know, you're really looking at an N of 11. So you really need some big, bigger studies to really make these what, judgments. What is, is there hyperactivity means mm -hmm. it's worse, but yeah. But decreased locomotion are the same thing. What's the different question? Right. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's counterintuitive in terms of, uh, but it is different questions. It's sort of the hyperactivity, you know, sort of just, you, you know, but then locomotion, right? They're more sedentary. They're, they're, and, and, and there's some of those locomotions are more, what, what is their physical? Uh, it's a different questionnaire. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm a, a very interested in, in how sleep apnea affects Alzheimer's. Um, I think that this is going to be where, so hopefully we, we can help. Um, if, the, if sleep and sleep apnea um, are associated with dementia, and we know the sleep apnea is associated with the, you know, amyloid and tau increased in the CSF and potentially leading to dementia, we, we need some more studies to really look at that. And sleep by itself can as well. And if Down syndrome, has more sleep apnea and they're more likely to have um, dementia, then this is where the field is going really to, to look to see if we can maybe um, intervene early on uh, for, for these patients. And, and of course there is one study out there, just one so far, but there probably will be many looking at the adult obstructive sleep apnea in, in, um, in people with Down syndrome. And they utilize some pretty heavy duty stuff. So research MRI, amyloid PET, PET scans, and then they divided, you know, what are the group characteristics? Mostly were cognitive stable, but some had mild cognitive impairment, 23%. Some had possible AD dementia and other had definitive AD dementia. And unfortunately in this study, they did not get PSGs. Uh, they had a sleep apnea by history and only 39% had them. So I'm thinking they probably didn't you know, uh, didn't express. They um, didn't think through it because they probably thought it was too expensive after the MRI. Right, yes. yeah, the MRI was pretty pricey. Well, yeah, you know, PSG by the you know by the relative standards, probably you know cheap. But um, but they had it only by history. And if you look at thirty nine percent, that's really pre the pre they 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 probably missed some. So by yeah. history alone is also probably problematic for that reason. But nonetheless, there was no difference between the sleep apnea history by the AD group. So that's one positive for the study, which really helped um, when we look at the results. What were the results? Well, sleep apnea, having sleep apnea, just having it was associated with white matter, and on MRI, white matter hyperintensity volume, as well as enlarged perivascular spaces, and was associated with greater cortical amyloid burden. And then anyone who was having sort of just amyloid border, we know that that's part of the pathophysiology of dementia. That's a strong signal in my mind, just having it by history alone. I wasn't associated with other, you know, cerebrovascular biomarkers, but I wanted to show these graphs because I, I don't know if I 
clearly see the difference, but by, of course, p-values and some other things, there's an increased amyloid burden for in the obstructive sleep apnea group. And then here, you clearly see some signals with ischemic small vessel disease, which is that hyperintensity and some other um, changes in the MRI. So if we're already seeing it in this, in this group, then, then we, and there are 50s, there are about 50s, then what could we be do, doing in the 40s and 30s to potentially mitigate some of these findings that we're seeing um, later on, and hopefully not have as much AV dementia, 8% of this group did. Early intervention will be key. All right. What else do we worry about? Cardiovascular consequences, right? We, you know, uh, that's always um, kind of something to think about. I want to highlight in particular um, that people with Down syndrome have a baseline pulmonary resistance. So there's sort of a, almost a setup for that pulmonary hypertension, as you see, and, 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 you know, put on top of that any burden of sleep apnea, and that could augment that. And so I'll show you that literature next here. A study in, it was retrospective uh, in children uh, with and without Down syndrome. So that's why that number is big, 318. Um, severe sleep apnea, as we know, severe sleep apnea is 10 or more, and they had an echo within a year. Um, how many had pulmonary hypertension? 8%. It's quite, quite, a, quite a large amount. So maybe that OHI of 10 is actually reasonable um, to consider severity. And so then they divided up their group into having pulmonary hypertension, no hypertension, no pulmonary hypertension. It turns out sleep-related hypoventilation and that de de definition, by the way, is the pediatric definition, um, was present in 25% of those who had pulmonary hypertension and less often with uh, pulmonary hypertension. So there, there's some potential ventilatory uh, associations, of course, not surprisingly. And then Down syndrome was also, um, you know, uh, much more prevalent in the pH group and instead, you know, compared with those without pH. Um, and so again, you know, we're seeing that signal with Down syndrome, not surprisingly, we have the underpinnings of that potential burden, and then on top of that, sleep apnea. So, you know, going to the beach here for a second, <laughs> I'm gonna reduce that cortisol a little bit for everybody. What's the evaluation of sleep apnea and Down syndrome? Um, and so there's some emerging evidence in this area as well. So right now, the, the gold standard is in-lab PSG for children in general, you know, and then children with DS. There is a current committee looking at home sleep apnea testing in children, so we'll see uh, what they come up with, because um, there are some potential utility for at least a type two. Um, nocturnal pulse oximetry, not good, essentially, <laughs> let's not do it. Is it good for screening? Yeah, some studies may say it's good and others you know, maybe too good. And we've noticed a lot of times children that keep things on. So we get all these falsely low hypoxia measures and we bring them in the lab and it's this big hoo-ha. So nocturnal pulse oximetry, it's, you know, it's fine, but you have to take it with a big, big, big grain of salt. And you have, a, you know, when you have a high prevalence, things, sensitivity is going to be high, right? So you want that specificity probably a little bit more. And there was a study in Down syndrome looking at pulse transit time. Um, pretty good if you're looking at just mild, yes, no type of thing. Not good when you get into the more severe range, which is really where we need to, to really, you know, um, understand things a little bit more. And then home. There's a lot of talk about home. Um, the home polygraphy in the UK study, um, they, they love home studies and they have all this wonderful resources to be able to do them. Um, like they did in the CHOP study down below the ages of ASAT level two, where somebody's putting it on and then going, oh, we don't have those resources, right? So, you know, this is great that you can do it and they've shown that you can. Um, we need the resources to be able to do that. But we do need to highlight the fact that people prefer this. In the CHOP study, they preferred, um, you know, patients had a preference for ASAT, 73% of them did. And some didn't, and, and we'll find those patients where, where parents will say, no, 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 I want you to get an accurate study and there's no way I'm going to help. I need help keeping things on my child. And so, but, but, but by and large, most people would, would I think, prefer, and this study um, supports that, a home sleep apnea test. There was not surprisingly more sleep on that and sensitive, sensitivity is supposed to be okay, uh, but you did have a higher AHI and PSG. So again, precision medicine here, not so much with HSAT, but you're going to get um, that with an in-lab. And you had, not surprisingly, again, lower O2 nadir on HSAT. That's where the pulse ox comes off, and you have these lower readings. I had a case um, 
uh, right, right when you know the, the, the emergence of you know shut down all the PSGs, we're doing only home studies. It was a case of a teenager with Down syndrome, and he's about to go to get his surgery. And this, they they really wanted you know a, a sleep apnea test, right? So we scurried, scurried. They said no, we can only do a home study. I said okay, let's dance the DX. This is crazy. You know, try to fight with the women. It didn't work. So you get the home study, and of course, what what do we find? No apnea. <laughs> But it was like 78%, 80% pulse oximetry all night. Called, you know, let's make sure there's nothing acute here. Nothing's going on. Mom came in. We had to do eventually some, we did it. I think we had to just because of the abundance of caution, we did a chest x-ray. Everything was fine, but you can see that some of these things are really limiting our ability to detect what, we look, what we're looking for, and then we find other things. So I think in some respect, you do want to be precise, particularly when you're dealing with a nonverbal group of individuals or a group of individuals who can't give you that history. All right, so treatment of obstructive sleep apnea is next. And how are we doing on time? Doing okay? Anybody want to say anything? We're good? Okay. So All right. the oximeter errors in HST, there's not a lot of literature on that. It depends on the oximeter. But presumably yeah. it's because it's half on and half off or that there's a shunt effect. That is, it goes from the emitter to the to the collector around the finger rather than it goes through the finger. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder if a transmittance oximeter would be better for that. That's interesting. And then there's a whole other discussion about oximetry with you know, color of skin and which one works yeah, better, yeah, right? But, but, Sampling but, time. But this one is 2%. You're not going to have 70%. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I, mean, I mean, people get a little crazy that way. Right. And mm -hmm. the idea is, is that, uh, you know, and, and those, if, if you notice, those are on, they, they, they say it's a big hullabaloo, it it's true, but that's if you did 200, you know, 2,000 patients in each group and the overlap and the error is, is detectable statistically. It's not necessarily there. I mean, are always plus or minus two percent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So the two percent difference is sort of like you go, okay, you got to use your judgment. Right. You right. don't you don't make the decision on whether or not you're going to give Paxil bit on the study. Right. Right. That's where it came. I'm right. Sorry. Right. No, that's that's good. Um, that's that's good a lesson. We should probably have a more talk on yeah, pulse oximetry because I think that's important to know our sensors, right? That's now EEG. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay. That and that's been uh, approved for children. So yeah, it's a type two approved for children. It doesn't integrate with our system, but so, something to think about. We have a chat. Oh, okay. So we have a chat question. I've been told. Hello everyone, welcome to UH Grand Rounds. Oh, Get your CME card. credit and email me if, you know. Okay, very good. So what is the first line therapy for children with obstructive sleep apnea and Down syndrome? Blurt it out. Tracheostomy. <laughs> Tracheostomy, no. <laughs> that kind of fell on the wayside when the CPAP came, right? So, <laughs> what is it? Yeah. TNA, tonsils, you know, um, I can't chirp up this group, but I can't begin to tell you how many times we have patients coming in who are like five years old and the parents are like, I really don't want to do CPAP. I'm like, we don't do CPAP at age five. You know, we don't do that. Unless, of course, we need to. Um, I'm not advancing because Slido is not letting me. There he goes. So when we think about obstructive sleep apnea in children, we're thinking steps. Whenever I meet a family, I'm thinking, okay, this is going to be a journey. Uh, because we, we first have to evaluate, right? And then we have to do a treatment for, uh, with, you know, usually first line uh, adenotonsillectomy. There will be some children who have very, very tiny tonsils, no adenoid tissue whatsoever, and they're not AT candidates. And that's another story. Um, and, and, and then if they did have a procedure, if they're not candidates, they have sleep apnea, what does our post AT follow up look like? And what do we do with residual sleep apnea? When do we evaluate the airway, which we have to, and sometimes we'll have to do dice and some other things, pap therapy, other therapies, other surgeries. So it really becomes a really multidisciplinary um, thing. And we always have to keep in contact with these families and ensure follow-up care is there. This is a treatment overview. I, I really liked this review if you wanted to, to look at it. Um, it's it really, it says children in pediatric sleep apnea, but it really goes beyond that. So it's really nice to, to have that review. 
Um, and surgery, I put on the top because we do start there in children. And as we move into adulthood, we're moving out of the surgical realm, except for when they're pap failures. And then we're looking at their airway and doing some other things. There's been some studies on mod modified pharyngeoplasty, UVPP, partial glossectomies. I'm gonna go into some of the tongue-based procedures um, uh, here. And then of course, new for 2023 is the hypoglossal nerve stimulator uh, being FDA approved for children um, with Down syndrome. Non-surgically, we have pharmacology, we have pap therapy, high flow by nasal cannula, which we'll just go into just one slide, orthodontics, myofunctional therapy, and weight management exercise. So similar things that you're going to see in your um, persons without Down syndrome. Um, so first line therapy, there's a myriad of studies. I just didn't want to inundate you with those. So I just put here a sort of a meta-analysis looking at, you know, the general you know, outcome of, of first line therapy being a dental tonsillectomy, um, using sort of uh, PSG outcomes looking at AHI, O2 or sleep efficiency and arousal index. And the reason why we're interested in sort of these things, is, you know, is, is that we know that sleep fragmentation and sleep architectural findings also could uh, augment sort of dementia down the road, not just from the hypoxia realm, but also from sleep fragmentation, right? So we're looking at the whole package um, and so post TNA, what happens, most people decrease uh, in their AHI as a group um, and increase in their O2 nadir. There's no change in sleep efficiency, at least in this meta-analysis, and there is a decrease in arousal index. So maybe we are helping with sleep fragmentation. And I didn't get into this because I don't have all the data. I have it only in abstract form. The success rate of surgery, if we're looking at an AHI greater or less than five, you know, still about almost, you know, 57%, it's still not great. You would think that that would be a little bit more. And if it's AHI less than one, it's 16%. So we're seeing a ton of people with residual obstructive sleep apnea who have uh, Down syndrome, um, which is what we're seeing in clinics. And of course they wanted to highlight post-operative complications, we have to be careful. Um, the high rate of, of residual sleep apnea after surgery has been highlighted in many, many studies. Standard surgeries may not cure, we know that. And some of the other studies looking at, you know, 48 to 63%, if we're looking at the other one, it's a little bit higher. More surgery is not necessarily better. So if I do a TNA and then a pharyngeoplasty, similar outcomes. Um, but there, are, you know, there probably needs to be some more surgical literature on um, TNA plus some other things potentially. Uh, because there are some other outcomes in some of these other tone-based procedures. Recurrence is really not predicted by any baseline measure. So here we go again, BMI doesn't predict HI, and age, at least in the younger population, doesn't predict, it does in the older population. Reasons for residual sleep apnea is in, in, intensely investigated. Um, one case series uh, looked from Southwestern, looked at predictors of um, you know, persistent, this P is persistent obstructive sleep apnea, and their study was 58%. And they found that age and, and asthma, and this is an older group. And so when you're looking at younger group versus older group, age can predict younger group, not so much. Um, and then asthma. What I wanted to highlight here, and, and this is where I would like to ask the sort of authors is, you know, why some people had more <laughs> increased age high post -op. Um, some people, some kids with TNA will gain weight, acute, you know, really acutely after having TNA. Um, it's actually a sort of one of the questions I like to ask the fellows, you know, what happens to BMI after TNA? You would think that, you know, sort of we're leaving some sleep, sleep deprivation and maybe, you know, BMI is better. BMI, BMI goes up in every child, even, even those who are obese. Okay, um, so, so then we're left with some questions, right? So if we have all this residual sleep apnea, when do we repeat a study? At what residual do we do we do we do something about it? Um, the standard really is three months post op, um, and if they have, you know, most of the this is all kind of general pediatrics. If they have a high AHI in their baseline, their hypoventilation. If they have an elevated BMI or other risks, Down syndrome is another risk. Ongoing symptoms and comorbidity, we would repeat that PSG. And then what about um, in, in very young age? Um, what about some residual AHI? What do we do and when do we do it and how do we do it, right? And so Fishman actually came out with some expert consensus here for pediatrics looking at you know, what do we do about residual apnea? And, and so that sort of mild, moderate group with symptoms doing something about it. And then that severe group definitely doing something about it. But then this, you know, sort of mild 
category, conservative maybe approach, intracortical nasal steroids. And I'm looking at my friend, Dr. Sydney over here, because he came to me and said, that doesn't work, right? And I'll show you some literature <laughs> uh, that might prove your point. Um, so weight management is just the very simplest thing, which is the hardest thing to do, right? It's just so simple, right? If we could all just do that, right? <laughs> so weight management, modifiable risk, it's a higher prevalence of, of higher BMI in, in children and adults with obstructive sleep apnea, this very large Dutch sample. They did, you know, they looked at sort of general population uh, versus Down syndrome and found higher rates. We know this already. I just wanted to highlight that. And comorbidity in particular did not influence prevalence rates. So, it's, you know, sometimes there are some additional factors, but we do have to individualize that care for those individual factors. Diet and exercises are key, but can we really get there? And so one of the things that's interest, interesting to me, and, and maybe other people would be, you know, sort of this um, masseter and temporal uh, muscle hypotonia. And, and that's associated with more sleep apnea and also being overweight. Um, and it, it could be just general, you know, functioning. Now that this is where my functional therapy could be very helpful, potentially, I'm not sure. Um, and secondly, there's increased leptin and decreased uh, resting energy expenditure in these individuals, and there's been a study looking at unfavorable diets as well. So there's maybe some factors that we can modify. Exercise we know helps sleep apnea adults, not a lot of in, 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 in adults with Down syndrome or children for that matter. Uh, but there is a study looking at, you know, if they have poor fitness, it's, a, it's associated and contributed from having musculoskeletal problems. So we have to deal with those when we're talking about exercise, of course. And then there is one study, I don't have to put it here, but it's rigorous exercise that helps change body composition. It's not just your, you know, little, little exercise, it's rigorous. And so you have to get these rigorous exercise put in place. You have to treat their underlying uh, morbidities, hypothyroid being one of them, um, and, and really being rigorous about diet. So um, it, it'll take a village. Um, so this is the anti-inflammatory medication talk, right? So do anti-inflammatory medications work for mild obstructive sleep apnea in pediatrics? It is the age old question. And there's lots of studies that say it does. And so that's why we're squirting for flonase and noses and giving Montelukast out. Um, but does it work? Uh, so in a retrospective study, uh, there's a couple. Um, in mild obstructive sleep apnea, and remember mild is that greater than or equal to one to five in children. Um, there's a couple different studies. Uh, both showed group differences that were no different, right? But I wanna highlight, you know, and sort of these are, you know, treatment groups, but I wanna highlight some, some issues with, with the studies I have on insurance, you know, these steroids and also sort of using Montelukas. Steroids in particular, do, do they use it? Every time, and especially if this is your retrospective studies, you can ask how many people ask, you know, how long did you use your flonase for? And they'll say, oh yeah, I used it every time when I needed it, right? That's not how it works, right? So if people were using it properly, we need those studies. But there were, like Dr. Sidney pointed out, he came to me and said, well, there's a prospective study. And there was in children. It's good job for you to be looking at the literature and, and also showed no group differences, right? So, so we do need to have the abundance of caution that this may not be uh, treating all people. I do want to highlight, though, that it does help with some. And so in that person with very bad inferior her, her hypertrophy, you know, um, a very, you know, inflamed airway, um, you know, with mild obstructive sleep apnea, we're not going to pop on CPAP. We may not do some other things, might be aggressive, but we could offer something here. And, and resolution of sleep apnea occurred in 20% uh, of children. I think that's really, really interesting versus the 7% with observation. So it is, it is helpful to know that we have very, you know, big limitations on using these medications and we have to be... Um, yeah, one time we were using nasal growth a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's nice. Was that for adults or children? Children. children. Mm -hmm. That would be the first thing in high school. Yeah, kind of, mm -hmm. yeah. It's like water. It's <laughs> not, it's over the counter. Right. Mm -hmm. It's not nasal steroids. Right. I mean, you could eat the whole thing and it would body. <laughs> <laughs> right. And then the studies came out with the intranasal cortical steroids, which did help diminish some. But um, so I was unaware that this study was going on. It was published in 2023. So, treatment um, with uh, what we use for ADHD, it's, uh, 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 you know, and I think there's a chat here in oxybutynin. Let's see. Hello, this talk. Okay. Um, 
So aware that it was happening for the adult you know, trials, but I didn't realize that children with Down syndrome were, were recruited. Um, and you know, in six to 17 year olds, this N was nine, it was only 15, 11 having all the data. Um, it was a double blind crossover trial value of these two doses all received them. So low dose and then high dose, just crossing over um, and looking at the primary outcome being OHI from the baseline. And so it's actually rather good. Um, you know, you know if, if we're not gonna do, you know, anti-inflammatories, could we do something like this? And looking at, you know, uh, seven to three, kind of both in the, you know, low, low and high dose, this is, you know, not, these are not big P values, ends, excuse me, uh, but the P values is, is quite remarkable, even despite that. Um, so, you know, I think my take home on this is, you know, low is okay here if we wanted to uh, use this potentially for our patients to reduce the burden of obstructive sleep apnea. Um, the only caveat is we use it uh, at tomoxetine you know, for an ADHD, is, you know, it can cause insomnia, and th these are promoting it, you know, at night. So, not so, not so sure about the side effect profile here. I'm waiting to maybe see the published studies, but I wanted to share this with you today. Secondary outcomes, no changes in um, quality of life. And not surprisingly, we have some improvements in ADHD, right? And some other behavior, uh, that's, that's not surprising. After we move from the mild category or failed, you know, kind of these things, what are we gonna do? We're gonna end up talking about CPAP at some point. It's definitely, uh, you know, second line to a, a adenotonsillectomy. Um, and, you know, it's, it, it's something that we have to offer our patients who need it. Uh, and it turns out in this retrospective cohort, there's actually greater usage in Down syndrome versus non-Down syndrome. We always shy away from it because these are children with special needs. And yes, it takes time, but they actually can end up being good users. And then there was another study actually in adults looking at the same thing and they were actually better users as well. Um, the only issue is poor clinical adherence data. So if you get their download data, um, they're gonna have residual AHI more commonly and they're gonna have greater leakage. Um, and, and so there's gonna be just a lot more hands-on from the caregiver to, to mitigate those things. And in a study by CHOP, uh, who's been really advocating for more studies in children with uh, Down syndrome, did a really nice job asking the caregiver experience. This is the first of its kind. And so what's your experience like? Because we know that the caregivers are 100% responsible for making this happen. Um, and they're a little bit overwhelmed at initiation, they say, but they get help from education support groups who are really supporting them with, with, with some materials. Family modeling helps uh, pediatric patients in general. So if a parent uses PAP, they're going to use PAP um, more likely. And that study was right here by Dr. Uh, Dr. Carol Rosen. And visual aids and storyboards work, especially for those who have autism. And so they can look at their visual cues and say, these are kind of the, the steps that we do to you know, put on your mask, you put on this, and you kind of give them those visual cues, very helpful uh, to patients with Down syndrome and autism, which is comorbid in many of these patients. There had to be a mutual understanding of patients not really pu pushing on to them. This is long-term therapy and they need to have buy-in. Um, and, and we have to overcome some of the sensory issues. Some patients with Alzheimer's have significant sensory issues. Putting something on their face can cause a lot of anxiety in that first angst. So just push it off, right? And especially if you start to blow that air in. So there's really, really nice strategies like desensitization strategies to help kind of build it in to desensitize to CPAP and then blowing that air in. And then of course, finding the right mask. So good luck if you have CMS <laughs> uh, because that's going to be a barrier. And so we have to often write letters um, for, for these patients. And we have to write letters because it takes time and sometimes beyond the 90 days to get to four hours. So writing letters, uh, hats off to Jennifer Stone and team because they're always writing letters on behalf of these patients to get um, masks and, and, and more time for these patients to, to, to adapt to, sleep, to their um, sleep apnea. Um, sleep apnea in adults with and without uh, Down syndrome, look at some adherence data in, in this population as well as well as out outcomes. And so there's a population study called the Discovery. It's a Swedish group, people on CPAP looking, you know, sort of a, a sort of an eight year period, lots of people on CPAP, 65,000, but only 64 had Down syndrome. So maybe it was maybe underestimated here potentially, but of those, what do they see? So people with Down syndrome versus non-Down syndrome, they were, they were often younger and uh, they had higher AHIs, higher sleepy scales, and notice this, lower hypertension. This is a common theme 
in almost every study that you'll see. They have lower hypertension, and, and, and this has been reported. So they're, of course, not going to have as many cardiovascular drugs. They're going to have more thyroid uh, hormone, understandably. They're going to have tonsillar surgery because they had sleep apnea, maybe as a child, and institutional living. And so those are some of the characteristics. But you're going to see these patients. They're going to see young patients with their caregivers in the clinic. And they're, you know, this is going to be maybe some of their profiles. Um, when you look at age, max, age and sex match outcomes, CPAP adherence is similar. So that's good, right? So we saw some studies that was better and similar, but it's not worse. Um, and so these people can do CPAP and do it well, um, but you know, potentially. And then they looked at all cause hospitalizations. Now this is both adherence groups, right? There are similar adherence groups, higher hospitalizations, but not surprisingly in the risk, in the independent risk factor being Down syndrome here. Um, Again, another study, and I'm highlighting the lack of hypertension, even though it didn't re reach statistical significance, there's just no one <laughs> with hypertension. It was this descriptive study with control group versus Down syndrome um, in adults. Um, and then uh, looking at sort of follow-up in 36 months. I don't know about you, but these curves look rather good. Usually we see compliance curves that go down over time. <laughs> these are going up. That's great. And hats off to this group. Um, and, and so the Down syndrome group and, you know, and the other group were similar in adherence. And at 36 months, they, they, they seem to be doing well. And they looked at maybe what are the differences in their outcomes? Um, you know, and so um, objective CPAP downloads, pretty similar. Uh, subjective, on the other hand, is not similar. So they're going to over-report uh, subjective CPAP use uh, when they have Down syndrome compared to when they do not. Um, their number of visits might be a little bit more. They need more hand-holding, and that's that's understandable. Um, and their number of mass changes may be a little bit more. So um, they can achieve adequate, com, uh, com, you know, adherence to CPAP with a little bit more, um, with a little bit more help. Um, this is a community dwelling group of adults, and they and a lot of adult studies are included 16 and older, which is interesting. Um, and then their AHI is greater than 10 plus symptoms. They looked at CPAP versus lifestyle, follow-up in 12 months. What happened? You know, this study, and it's interesting when you read the study, the lot of eligibility. And when you're recruiting for these studies, so you start to see dwindling kind of numbers. And then they ended up with 19 out of 28 stay on CPAP. So that's really, um, you know, 37 adherents you know, unable to tolerate, dislike CPAP, refusal to use. So that's some real things, even though I'm giving you some positive things like, yes, they're going to use their CPAP. This, they are, there are going to be some problems with CPAP. Um, and hence the reason we need non-PAP, um, you know, avenues for these patients. Um, but look at the outcomes um, for the patients at their baseline versus 12 months. There's a very different, um, of course, this wasn't, um, you know, in terms of, you um, Anyway, uh, but but this there was there was a lot of variables here that they looked at that improved. So pictorial, uh, the upward sleepiness scale. I need to get my hands on that. So if anyone has it, please let please share. <laughs> um, uh, but it'd be nice to have that in our clinics. Uh, we have the modified pediatric upward sleepiness scale, but I don't have in my hands the pictorial upward sleepiness scale. I did, and I and I lost it when I came over uh, to Rainbow uh, with my file. So if you have it, please share. Um, and then some other uh, other things, all all improved verbal and nonverbal IQ improvements, uh, sleepy scales, anxiety depression scales got better in behavioral improvements overall. And so adults with Down syndrome can you know if we it, we can be offset by some of these things that are problematic in their comorbidity by the treatment of obstructive sleep apnea potentially. I do want to put a plug in for high flow by nasal cannula because there was one study looking at this in 2019. Prospectively, three of the six participants successfully managed with sleep at, uh, for sleep apnea using high flow. This is a gentleman using it. I uh, didn't have, you know, sort of the airbow is really out there, and that's what we're using for um, pediatrics. But high flow by nasal cannula doesn't matter what the seal is. So it kind of sits there. So they're still getting some flow. It really works very well for younger patients. Um, so, and, and it's been, it, it's a treatment option for pediatric patients. I haven't seen the data for adults, but um, it is something that if you hear about it, that's what it is. It, the flow can be with and without oxygen. It doesn't have to always have oxygen attached to the flow. And it looks very much like CPAP with the humidifier and little kind of thing here, but it's a, but, uh, it's a high flow nasal cannula and it sits under the nose. Um, now, what if they feel CPAP? We need to have kind of a next step for them. And so, you know, as they go through their 
treatment options, uh, there's an opportunity to direct based on their um, at least selection of surgery by DICE or potential MRI. So DICE directed surgery, what, what does it do? Does it help? Two different studies. One says it does help, the other doesn't. Um, but you know, in the, in the study that did, the, the AHI did improve. And other studies have really no change in AHI. And I wonder if that's more about the DICE than maybe the surgery and the patient. Uh, but DICE potentially could help select surgery. surgery. Mm -hmm. surgery. Or, 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 yeah, or the surgeon who's selecting the surgery, right, based on the DICE, because it still needs that subjective lens, absolutely. And then um, with MRI, could we identify some level of obstruction? And it's for sort of an expensive way to do it, uh, but, but but it can happen and as it, as illustrated in this study of 27 children, stats plus TNA. And they, but they, they wanted to highlight too that there are multiple sites of airway obstruction identified, that glossoptosis, which I'll show you a picture of in a second, uh, with recurrent adenoid tissue. That can happen, 63%. Because an MRI at this instance, it, it gives you so much more anatomic. I, I, I don't think people should be afraid of it. Now, of course, sedation yeah. is what you need for that. Right, right. But so that's for you, even, I mean, I, I don't know why you don't see it when you fail CPAP. Why do you do an MRI and figure out what's going on? Oh, no, no, no. Well, it's expensive if you go compared to your what? Your $40,000 <laughs> surgery? Or right, what? exactly, right. So it is, I mean, the, the cost models, especially, the, you, that's true. There's some significant bias here, I think, right? So yeah. I mean, you look at the radiograph literature, and they're very strongly supporting MRI and look at, you know, this. Yeah, they don't have good outcomes, right? They're bots. They say, oh, there's no way to do it. Well, that's the way it is. Yeah. 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 There's no way to do it. There's no way to do it. There's There's no 30% uh, <laughs> low bush, and then there's a hypoparyngeal collapse that, how do they determine that from an MRI? Right, right. Is mm -hmm. the person breathing? And I, and I don't, <laughs> this is one that I um, um, summarized, but yeah, that's, those are all very good points. I will say that <laughs> adenoid tissue doesn't have to be an MRI. You could do a plain film, this is what we do. We look at things, like right? So you know, in terms of, and ENT will do that often, right? So if we have, so we have recurrent sleep apnea, we have recurrent symptoms of sleep apnea. They can't use CPAP. Can we? We send them back to ENT. What are they going to do? They're going to look at adenoid hypertrophy on maybe plain foam or something like that if they can't scope them. Or you can scope them. dice versus MRI for that. Because <laughs> the dice people say you miss tonsillar hypertrophy with just an examination. Right. Right. You can, and some some don't allow you to scope. That's that's the only that's the only thing here. Yeah. Oh, we're at nine o'clock. Lingual tonsillectomy. I just wanted to show this. Um, you know, tongue based operation. Uh, the essence of this is it works uh, for people who are uh, you know for people with sleep apnea. And then lingual tonsillectomy. If they're overweight, it doesn't work. If it does, it does work. Um, this is rapid maxillary expansion. It works in one case report. We need more studies. Oral uh, facial myofunctional therapy. Um, not uh, there's you know 18 recorders here. It didn't really change the AHI, but it did do something to the oxygenator, which I think is interesting. Um, so we don't want to poo poo that study. Uh, we want to see some more studies. This is glossoptosis. It's a really good example. It turns out that the tongue here is not macroglossy, it's relative macroglossy to a small airway. So their tongues are fine. It's just it, it displaced and into a small and crowded um, airspace. And so this is where tongue-based operations can be helpful. But this is also where hypoglossal nerve can be helpful. And, you know, um, this is in the palm of my hand, a little inspired device, remote control goes here, trials in sleep apnea. I did want to show you, there's a bunch of studies on here, but um, I do want to show the polysomnogramic outcomes of this study. Doesn't all go away, uh, but it certainly diminishes it. And they have some really other good outcomes like, you know, um, the OSA 18 quality of life instrument, as well as the, uh, you know, sleepy scale. Uh, and compliance is rather good. Nine hours of usage. I, I'm, I'm impressed. Are these from different centers, these studies, or this just is one center? This is, I think, the multi center. This one is multi center. This is the pivotal study that, um, that garnered some FDA approval. Yeah. Future. 
lots of things that we need. And it was outlined in this nice paper. If you're interested, if you do research or if you're just interested in what the future guidelines, this is where the money is. This is where there's, you know, all the support for research and finances can go. They've outlined what they need from the literature. They need sleep phenotypes, they need normative sleep data, they need impact on neurocognition. And I'm especially interested um, in particular in, in the dementia um, associations. I want to put a plug in for the study we're doing, DOSA. It's a, it's a randomized control trial for oxygen and conservative therapy. And it's a multi-center trial led by you know, Dr. Redline um, and, and, and Dr. Amina Roof at um, uh, Roof in Cincinnati. Um, lots of people involved, lots of things involved. There's neurocognitive outcomes as the primary but there's going to be echocardiogram and PSG and some phenotyping as well as sleep measurements in this trial. Some resources for organizations and things, links here if you want them, I'm happy to email them to you. And then future directions. So I just hope you, today you learned something about sleep apnea and Down syndrome. It's common, early detection is key. Maybe intervention could also be helpful in impacting some of these long-term outcomes, especially those that are cognitive. PAP compliance can be achieved. Um, every time I read that, it just humbles me a little bit because it's sometimes challenging in clinics, but time, 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 and lots of support hopefully uh, will, will get us there. Um, if not, there's good alternatives to PAP and there's growing literature hopefully that will help us guide our care in the future. So happy to take any questions.